Good evening. Thank you. In acknowledging um, that we're meeting on the traditional territory of the Musqueam, the Salvatooth, and uh, the Squamish, um, Ryder did a fine job acknowledging at, at the beginning of our uh, meeting, so thanks for that. Um, I've been chair of the uh, Aboriginal Homelessness Steering Committee for Metro Vancouver for eight years or so. And my interest in homelessness stems from my own history. Um, I always say I, I was born homeless because my mom was homeless uh, when I was born. And um, she wasn't able to take me from the hospital. Um, and I grew up in care after that. Uh, so I always think I, I've always been homeless. Um, until I aged out. But um, in terms of um, the situation in, in Vancouver, uh, you know, the, there's over 30% of the homeless are Aboriginal. So again, the, the population is, is overrepresented. Um, and there's no um, permanent Aboriginal shelter in the city. Uh, there's a temporary one that uh, came in with um, uh, Mayor Robertson when he first uh, got into power and uh, as one of the heat shelters, and that was sort of the first positive move we had ever in the city in terms of uh, dealing with uh, people that are, are entrenched on the street. Um, and it's a 100-mat facility, and it, it's... Uh, very well run by the Friendship Center. Um, there's such a need for it. Um, and we're, we're trying to develop a, a permanent shelter. Uh, and we're hoping that the city, the province, uh, feds sort of step up. And, and we have some private foundation money uh, in the project. And we're hoping that that will try to uh, you know, move in a positive direction if we can um, have the the uh, facility have also affordable housing and and uh, some transition units and and some family uh, units as well because that's one of the things that's lacking. Um, the situation uh, in the shelter right now is not good. Uh, it's a big warehouse kind of space, just one big room, and uh, you know there's a four foot pony wall that divides the men from the women. Uh, and that's privacy. That's that's about all there is. Uh, there's no shower facilities, and you know, it's uh, there's no food uh, facilities that on site. But it, it at least uh, is is something, I suppose. Uh, but we're trying to uh, bring something that's uh, th that's better uh, into the city. One of the things that we advocate for is more housing units. Uh, there's such a lack of uh, political will by senior levels of the government, provincial, federal. Uh, the federal just gives away the responsibility and says, well, we're not involved in housing anymore. Um, we just aren't going to do it. They see it as a social good, not as a, a need for uh, citizens. And um, I think Canada's only country in the G8 that doesn't have a national uh, housing strategy. And you know, it just falls on deaf ears trying to advocate for more, you know. Um, it's it's a, a big hole. The federal government right now, and I don't know, most, many of you uh, have probably heard that the federal government runs the Homelessness Partnering Strategy Program, which is homelessness uh, funding. And they're reorienting their strategy to uh, be housing first is what they call it. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you have heard of housing first. It comes out of the states, um, and my fear is that it's not going to house people because there's just a lot of barriers in the way. Uh, they're trying to operate it um, within a, a low, um, what's the word? Um, no, uh, just thinking um, in terms of uh, the number of rental units available. Uh, there's not, no, there's not enough, and, and the way they're trying to operate it is a scattered site model, where you know they're going to 
be looking in the market for private units and, and that. Um, Especially now. Yeah, well, they're not, there's no capital dollars in, in the new program, so there's nothing to build. Um, so they're going to rely on what's existing. Um, and I just don't see that as a, a very uh, good solution. And I guess within the Aboriginal community, um, congregate housing does work um, because it, it does build a community um, in the building as opposed to a scattered site. So that, that's a bit of an issue. And one of the things that we see too with the new program is the exclusions that are going to happen. Uh, existing treatment programs, for example, will no longer be eligible. And it's just like, it just seems to be counterintuitive to what should really be happening. Um, so we have programs within the Aboriginal community that provide services to women, children, uh, and families. And you know they're being told that, well, your program will no longer be eligible for funding because it's not housing. So we're really struggling with how that's going to play out. And uh, yeah, it's a it's a big issue, but I, I think that you know the city has been um, trying to uh, support initiatives, um, but I'd, I'm not sure that that they're doing everything they can um, a as an architect working. In, in the city, uh, there's barriers. There's lots of uh, barriers that could uh, be uh, better handled. Um, just just sort of the you know the bureaucracy running into the bureaucracy and uh, trying to design s buildings that may be more culturally uh, sensitive. Um, we run into comments from city hall that. I don't deem very constructive. Um, so th there's a lot of, lot of work for sure that could be done. And it doesn't really matter which administration sort of is in place because you know, um, I've been licensed uh, since 1995. Um, and it doesn't matter sort of who's in power. You know, the, the rules are still there that are really hard to, to get around. And, <laughs> well, here you'll laugh at this one. Um, but we did a project uh, at the corner of Grandview and Nanaimo, uh, the Aboriginal Children's Village is what it's called. It's a building for foster families. And it's a partner, the, the building is owned by Illuminative Housing Society, and they partnered with uh, Vancouver Aboriginal Child and Family Services to put fast foster families in the, the building. and. Uh, having grown up in care, I was very interested in, in that building. Uh, and the model that they're um, using there is that the, the units are allocated to the children so they can grow up in, in place. And if there's a family breakdown, it's the foster parents that get taken away. So it's not the kids. So to me, that, that's much better. Um, and it, it keeps the kids sort of in, in the community. But <laughs> when we were doing the design, uh, even things like colors were, were an issue. Um, you know, the building has a red fascia, which is uh, around the, uh, the, the edges of the roofs. And um, City Hall wouldn't allow us at first to do red because it was too exotic. That was the, com that was the comment. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, was, it was too exotic. So it was a bit of an issue. And, and I couldn't do anything with it as an architect. Um, I'm expected to know the rules and I have to abide by them, although I have clients that keep wanting to break the rules and you know I get caught in between. But for me, the best way to handle City Hall is to ask the client to go and talk to City Hall because they will listen to a landowner or you know, a nonprofit society more than they will listen to me because they'll just tell me, you know the rules, live within them. And the owner can go and say, I want it red and back with you. And so we did it red and you know it was fine <coughs> in the end. Um, but that was sort of a, an example of 
silliness. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. Um, anyways, that's that's about all I have to say. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks.